<laughs> hey, good afternoon, everyone. Great to see such a, such a full room. I think if people come a little late, they're going to have to come sit in the front of the church. So <laughs> great to see such a full crowd uh, late on a Friday. Hey, it's really a pleasure to be here. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Tim Hanley. I'm the acting keys dean of the College of Business Administration. And today, I'm really excited to bring you the 2021 Marger Memorial Lecture, named in honor of Dr. Theodore Marburg. I want to have Dr. Lovell come up in just a couple of minutes to more formally introduce our speaker. Before I do that, I'd like to give you a little bit of background on this lecture. In fact, it was really interesting when our team shared with me a little bit of the history of the Marburg Lecture Series. We started this series back in the 90s due to a generous gift from the Marburg family to honor the legacy of Dr. Marburg. He was a former department chair and a longtime member of our economics department here at Marquette. And, a, and he was, had an incredibly strong legacy. In addition to being a superb teacher and a real mentor to our students, Dr. Marburg was just an excellent scholar, really put Marquette's econ department on the map. His scholarship turned many ways the economic disciplines really enhances capitalism and our influence in the American society. Hence, the Marburg Speaker Series gives us a tremendous, unique forum to discuss these ideas. And we've had a terrific history of phenomenal speakers that have come join us over the past few years. Really interestingly, and we were talking to Dr. Jackson about this just a couple of minutes ago, this series has had a lot of distinguished speakers, including over the past, past four years, two Nobel laureates in economics. Isn't that unbelievable here at Marquette? two Nobel laureates that have been here on this very stage. We told Dr. Jackson this might be good for him. But uh, really, really excited he's here. So doctor, we're just so pleased to have you. Um, on format, uh, I know you'll have a few questions. Why don't you hold them towards the end of the lecture? He's got a lot of great things to share with us. And maybe with that, I'd now like to welcome to the stage Dr. Michael Lovell. As you all know, he's the 24th president of Marquette University. I'd like him to say a few comments and give you a more formal introduction to our speaker, Dr. Jackson. Mike, just come on up. Thank you. Uh, well, good afternoon. And I, again, I, I want to reiterate what uh, Dean Hanley said. It's great to see such a, a large crowd on a Friday afternoon, uh, particularly because we have such a distinguished speaker here with us today. Uh, it's really my pleasure to be at another Marburg lecture. I've been able to attend several in the past. And, it's really true, the caliber of speakers we've brought to campus since 1995 have been unbelievable. Uh, obviously, this is a very, very exciting time for Marquette, in particular our College of Business Administration. Uh, the momentum is just really building across campus. It's building right outside the window uh, as, as we leave this auditorium to see the progress that our new business building is making as it comes up out of the ground where, where we couldn't be more excited. Um, you know, and again, I don't want to put any pressure uh, on today's speaker, but uh, I think uh, we've come to expect now uh, that we get Nobel laureates, you know, uh, coming at us in the future. So hopefully we can expect even bigger things from, from Professor Jackson uh, after his lecture is over today and he, he goes back and continues his amazing work. Um, <clears throat> you know, as, as I think about the change that the world has undergone over the, over the last 20 months, uh, there's really never been a better time to bring uh, Dr. Jackson to campus to discuss how our social networks are evolving and responding to market forces and impacting our economic mobility and stability as a, as a country and a world. Um, Dr. Jackson is the Eberly Professor of Economics at Stanford uh, of the School of Humanities, and he currently serves as chair of their economics department. Uh, Dr. Jackson is an author, an award-winning teacher scholar, and a strong collaborator dedicated to advancing his field. He holds two degrees in economics, a bachelor's degree, uh, from Princeton and a PhD from Stanford University. While teaching, Dr. Jackson also serves as an external faculty member at the nonprofit Santa Fe Institute, as well as president and fellow of the Game Theory Society. He holds membership in the National Academy of Sciences and fellowship in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Economic Theory, and the Econometric Society. Among his many impressive accolades for both instruction and contributions to his field, Dr. Jackson was awarded the Jean Jacques LaFont Prize in 2020. This prize is given to a renowned international economist whose research combines the theoretical and the empirical together. In addition to dedicating his time to the students and fellow economists, 
Dr. Jackson has written two books and countless articles on social and economic networks. We are privileged to hear him speak today. Please give a warm Marquette welcome to Dr. Matthew Jackson for his keynote address, Social Networks in Homophily, Implications for Inequality and Economic Mobility. So thank you very much for the kind introduction. Thank you to the university, the school, the department, everybody for having me here. And, and it's actually, I, I had a chance to do some research on Theodore Marburg just to look back and see what his legacy is. And as an economic historian, he had remarkably broad interests and covered labor markets, um, how small businesses operated. Uh, so it, it was, you know, I think his, his legacy leaves um, uh, an, an important um, uh, set of questions for how personal interactions uh, affect outcomes. And so that's what I'm gonna talk about a bit today. And I wanna start with just a quick picture. And what I'm gonna show you is a high school. These are, I'm gonna show you a high school of students. And I'm gonna show you friendships among those high school students. And I'm gonna show you two different pictures. The first picture is a fictional high school. This is not a real high school. This one was constructed by a computer. And then I'm going to show you the real high school. And what I want you to do is try and figure out what the differences are. Okay? So both of these high schools have 255 students. And they, ha they have exactly the same number of friendships. And the first one is drawn completely at random. So I just put down 255 students, gave it a set of friendships, and told the computer to draw those friendships at, at random. Okay, this is the, the picture you get. It looks kind of like a spaghetti bowl. And then this is the actual high school. And this is a US high school. And this is drawn by what's known as, as, a, as a spring algorithm. So what the spring algorithm does is it looks at two, two people. And if they're friends, it moves them closer together on the picture. And if they're not, it moves them further apart. So what it's trying to do is see if there's a pattern in the data. And the spring algorithm was done both to the random high school and the real high school. And what you can begin to notice is there's a split in this high school, right? There's a group at the top that basically don't have friendships with the group at the bottom, okay? So that's the high school. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put in, I'm gonna color these nodes by the race of the students, okay? And so here, now you can see the racial composition of this high school. And in particular, the blue nodes are self-reported as black, the yellow nodes are self-reported as white, um, the red nodes are Hispanic. So this is mostly a black, white, composed high school, but it's a high school that on paper looks very well integrated, and yet when you look internally to the high school, it's very segregated, okay? And that's what the homophily that I'm gonna talk about today is, that when people organize themselves, even within institutions, they might tend to separate themselves and split themselves across different um, categories. So this is a picture from a high school. This is not unique to the United States. It's not unique to high schools. Um, this is a picture from data we've been collecting for over a decade now in India. So this is a rural village in India. I'm going to talk more about these data t t tonight or this afternoon. Um, these are households. And each household, there's a link between two households if, in this case, they um, borrowed and shared kerosene and rice with each other. These are relatively poor villages. They need to share these things to, um, to get by. And these relationships are ones that are fairly important for them. And now the nodes are colored, the households are colored by caste designation. So the, the blue, these um, squares, the gray squares, are what are known as general and otherwise backward castes, which are relatively advantaged castes. And the red nodes are what are known as scheduled castes and scheduled tribes, and those are the relatively disadvantaged castes that, uh, as recognized by the um, Indian government. And here, um, again, in this case, there's about a 15 times higher chance that two families are, are connected to each other if they're within the same caste designation as compared to when they're across caste designations. And furthermore, in this picture, if you begin to look at these scheduled castes and scheduled tribes, they split into two categories where there's actually only one connection across those. So again, very strong homophily. 
And this homophily has a lot of consequences. It's going to have consequences for what people know, who they, um, what kind of norms they have, what opportunities they have. So there's a lot of things that are going to be driven by this. And what I want to do to today is take you through some of the consequences of homophily and also how these networks are being shaped by um, technological advances and other kinds of interventions. Okay. So what we're going to do in terms of an outline is I'm going to talk first about homophily and some basic implications, and I'll talk about some implications for inequality. And then we're actually going to look at some data um, that we've collected at um, Caltech in its undergraduate population, and we'll look at the um, homophily there, and we'll look at some consequences for how well the students are achieving. So how does homophily affect it, their, their achievement? And then we're going to look at some of the forces that are changing networks and how these networks are evolving over time. Okay. So that's the basic outline. So let's start with just some big picture for inequality. And, and I'll start by, you know, saying why did inequality become such a, a hot topic over the last couple of decades? Um, this picture will give you some idea. And this is just looking at, at Gini coefficients, so measurement of how unequal a society is. These are income genies. And so it's looking at, you know, pick two people at random, how much wealthier is the richer person compared to the poor person. If they, were, if they had all the wealth and the other person had none, you'd have a value of one. Um, and so, you know, like 50 means they're about 50% richer on average, the, um, the, the richer person than the poor person. Okay. In the U.S., it actually went down uh, after the Second World War, and it's been climbing up again and now reaching um, the, the heights that it hit during the Great Depression. China's been very rapidly uh, gaining and, and actually passing us. UK has been rising. It's been rising in a lot of countries around the world, and so inequality has become a hot topic. Regardless of whether it's been rising or not, it still tends to be high in a lot of places. And so we want to understand why is it high, and also why is it persistent? Why, why is it such a, a, a pernicious thing that's pervasive across both societies and across time? And I'm going to show you here what's known as the Gatsby curve. And the Gatsby curve is a relationship between inequality and immobility. So inequality is just looking at how unequal are, is the distribution of income in a given time period now. So we're just looking at a, a, a specific um, point in time. And we're asking inequality across people. Immobility is saying, um, how well does your parent's situation predict your situation? So in mobility, if, if uh, my parent's situation perfectly predicts me, then I have no chance of making it in the world. Whatever I was born into is what's going to be my outcome. And so here, the Gatsby curve, which was popularized by Alan Kruger in a, in a, um, a speech in 2012, um, notes that this relationship, that immobility and inequality are closely related to each other. And in particular, countries that tend to have high inequality also tend to have high immobility. Okay. And in particular here, you'll see you know, the United States is up here, China, Peru, and so forth. Countries that tend to be fairly low, uh, uh, northern European countries. Canada actually does very well. As, but we'll, we'll, we can talk a little bit later about what's special about countries that are doing better, what, what, about countries which are, are doing worse. But what I want to do is, is talk about why we should expect these things to be related to each other. Why is it that we not only have inequality, but we also have immobility, and why are those two things correlated? Okay. And um, so just you know, in terms of this immobility, here is just asking how correlated is a child's income with that parent's income? OK, so inequality, why do we care? Well. Inequality itself, we care partly just for fairness. It might be that you know, people, for whatever reasons, were unlucky and ended up with um, worse outcomes in life. Uh, it's a form of social insurance. So society can insure them against things that they couldn't privately insure against. Immobility has a, a different philosophical or, or moral grounding in terms of unequal opportunity. So people never have a chance. To, to realize their talents or to realize um, the welfare that others do. That's something that we care about for a, for a, a very um, basic reason. And then from an economist perspective, um, these kinds of missed opportunities also affect productivity and growth. So it's not only that we end up with an unequal society and some people not using their talents, but then we all suffer when those people don't go on to make inventions or to contribute to society. And so we care for all three of these reasons. Okay. And 
Um, just in terms of how homophily impacts these, and then I'm going to take you through this in a little more detail. Homophily matters for a variety of different reasons. And I, I put three important ones here. And um, one is contacts, so opportunities. And I'll spend a little time unpacking that. So it turns out that it's very hard to get an interview, it's very hard to get a job if you don't know somebody at a company. And if your network doesn't give you that access, it's much harder to get employed in a good situation than if you do have that access. And secondly is information. So who, who are your peers? What are they telling you? What do you know about, you know, if, even if you got a, a scholarship to go to university, do you know what it takes to apply to university? Do you know how to prepare yourself? Do you know what it's going to involve? Um, these kinds of questions can keep people back as well. And then peer influence and pressures. Just what are the norms in the society? Um, what are other people around me doing? Okay, so let's take the first one and let's talk a little bit about job contacts and I'll talk a little bit about how homophily is going to matter here. And in, um, in particular, when you look at job, um, how people get jobs, a huge amount of that is through social contacts. And that tends to be um, pretty much pervasive at all skill levels and in all industries. And uh, you know, actually one of the early researchers in this was George Schultz, um, uh, former um, Secretary of State and economist. Um, but th th this has been something that's been studied over the years. Mark Granovetter, famous sociologist, did a lot of work on this. But uh, when you look at jobs, a lot of people get jobs through referrals. And these connections actually predict, you know, when you look at somebody's connections, look at their network, that tends to predict whether they're going to get referrals and what their subsequent outcomes are. And so, for instance, there's a nice study by Ron Lashever, which looked at um, army companies where people are randomly put into friendships because they go into the trenches together. And then he looked at what their outcomes were later on, and he found about a 40% spillover in the sense that if I got put into a company where the people around me ended up being well employed afterwards, I had a 40% higher chance of getting employed afterwards and uh, a higher income as well than if I was in a company where the people tended to be unemployed. So you get a, a fairly large uh, spillover effect, and we're going to talk about that. And the reason that uh, we can go into details afterwards, but there's a lot of reasons that employers use referrals because they are able to identify people who tend to be um, more productive, lower turnover, fewer accidents, more patents, higher profits per worker. So when you look at workers hired through referrals versus um, cold applications, uh, referrals actually do make a big difference in, the, in that productivity. Okay, so why, why can referrals have a role in inequality? So let's think of a very simple world where we've got some people who are employed. Um, we have these arrows pointing to their friends. These are people that then can get referred. These people have a higher chance of getting jobs than the people who don't have those referrals. So there's some people who don't have friends who are employed. They don't end up getting those referrals. And now let's think of a world where we have different people. Um, let's call them blues and greens. And this could be ethnicity. It could be gender. It could be religion or caste. Um, so for whatever reason, there's different types of people, and they tend to have homophily. So they tend to be friends with their own types. So the blues are friends with blues, and the greens are friends with greens. Okay. And the way I've drawn this picture, this society is going to be fairly equal. So the greens have just as much employment, just as much contact. Um, the greens have an equal chance as, as the blues. But if we go to a world where, for whatever reason, the blues have a higher history of employment, so the blues have the, the past jobs, then we can begin to see why inequality and immobility are going to be linked to each other. Right? So here we've got unequal outcomes. The greens have lower employment in, in the current um, time period. But we're also going to see that in the next um, cohort or the next generation because the jobs are flowing through these referrals, and so the blues have a chance of getting employed, a higher chance of getting employed than the greens do. Okay. And so here, um, that leads to not only inequality, but it leads it to perpetuate itself. And it also leads to a loss in productivity because you've got a bunch of greens here who aren't part of that labor market and don't have a chance to use their talents to actually be productive. So you see all three of these things, the inequality, the immobility, and the productivity coming out of this one part, where now the social structure gives us a lens on that, which is different from just a simple um, story of unequal outcomes in a particular point in time. 
So homophily gives us a lens to understand this and to understand policies that might help um, alleviate this. And there's a lot of reasons that you might see these kinds of concentration and referrals. You know, there's going to be an inequality. Some people just have more friends. Um, it turns out that males tend to be better connected um, than females, even within employed males and females, if you look at that. Um, men disproportionately are more likely to refer men. So when you look at you know, these, these kinds of networks, you see uh, um, situations where the, the referrals tend to be unequally spread across the population. Um, and then you've got you know, these groups having higher historical employment and homophily. So you put this all together and you get this you know, inequality and mobility and production all intertwined. And you know, that means that we care about the structure of these networks, about the homophily, and about the outcomes. Okay. So let, let me say just a couple of words about policy and then we're going to come back to that at the end of this. Um, so when we're thinking about this, what's about, what about affirmative action? What, what, what's the point of affirmative action in this context? Well, in the usual context when we think about affirmative action, we think about it just sort of reducing inequality, right? So we're bringing people in, we had unequal outcomes, and we're, we're trying to change the inequality. But more generally, it's also going to reduce immobility. Because when you give the greens a job, then they have the ability to refer more greens and to also give them information about what it takes to be employed as a green and so forth. And so that not only transfers in the, in the current period, but it also gives you um, a multiplier effect that's that social multiplier effect where you're reducing the immobility, not just the inequality. And future productivity is going to be enhanced as well. So I put future here because actually affirmative action in, in the current period, it could be that what I end up doing is displacing some of the um, blues um, and replacing them with greens. And, and depending on how you do the affirmative action, you could have short-term costs but long-term benefits. And so you know, understanding how these policies can be constructed is something that ends up being important. Okay. So just a couple more comments on this, and then we're going to look at some more data. Um, you know, things like universal basic income, health care, redistribution, um, I want to think of those as addressing symptoms of inequality and symptoms of immobility, but not necessarily changing the root causes. So it's possible that you don't necessarily change the social structure which could be underlying this, whereas um, policies that also ad ad address these deeper issues can be ones that then have longer lasting impacts. And that's not to say that you don't need policies to, in, you know, to deal with the symptoms, but it's to say that you, you don't necessarily expect them to eliminate immobility. If you want to deal with immobility, you have to figure out why that's happening and then go with those root causes, which can be deeper than the, um, you know, the symptoms that we're seeing on, uh, on the surface. So you get you know, sort of network effects. You can also think of a lot of you know, um, mentorships, role models, anything which actually changes the network, which changes that access, which changes the information flows, can have a, this kind of network forward policy that's going to be very different from just redistributing income. Okay. Um, one, one thing I just wanted to mention also, if we wanted to think about changing the networks, uh, if you want to think about changing the networks a bit, so if you want to say, well, part of the problem is the homophily, but when we look at that high school, 255 students, um, they were completely split internally. How do we overcome that? Well, um, if we want to think about you know, social engineering, as it were, if you wanted to think about how people are going to organize themselves in, inside an institution, I, I did some work with Sergio Carini and, and Paulo Pin, and what we found was if you looked at high schools of, say, size 1,000 or more compared to a size of 1,000 or less, you tended to find more homophily in the larger schools. So bigger school, more homophily, even with the same composition. And the idea there is basically larger schools and larger organizations allow you to have more tracking inside, more organizations, sub-organizations inside, more opportunities for students to separate and to segregate themselves. Smaller schools tend to put them into closer proximity with each other, and that exposure then leads to, to more interaction and more friendships. Um, you get almost zero homophily if you look at the very small schools in that same data set. So there's 84 schools in that data set. The really smallest schools, once you get down below 100 students, tend to be very well integrated. 
And that's not necessarily to say we want to build lots of small schools, but it tells us, look, if we've got a large institution and we tend to see people separating themselves within that institution, we might want to think about re redesigning the ways in which people interact. So for instance, Stanford now has a new res residential policy for its undergraduates, where what we're doing is we're putting students into smaller residential groups where they stay in that same group for all four years. And that fosters more interaction in smaller groups than if we just put them in large dormitories and then have them go through their four-year experience that way. So this kind of policy, you know, you can begin to get a lens for what might impact homophily. Okay, so that's um, one picture. I want to spend time giving you a little deeper dive into homophily so you can see a little more of, of how it's operating. And in particular, there's nuances here. So homophily has, you know, it, 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 we have homophily for different reasons. So part of the reason is we like to be around people similar to ourselves because we can relate to them, because they have better, you know, they can offer us more information. Um, we, we share background, we, we know what to expect from them. So there's a lot of reasons for homophily, but it also has some implications on, on the negative side. And I wanna take a look inside a university microcosm. And this is work I've been doing with um, Stephen Nye, Eric Snowberg, and Yariv. And what we did was we looked at the Caltech student body and we followed them for three years. So we surveyed them for three years. We actually got about 90, uh, a little more than 90% participation. So we paid them for their time. We got a very good look at, it's a small institution, so we were able to track most of the students. And we're gonna follow the 2013 cohort through and look at their friendships and then look at some of the outcomes that they had. Uh, Caltech's uh, an unusual school, it's a, a, a um, you know, most, mostly uh, sciences and engineering. It's about 35% female and 65% male, so it's a heavily um, male-skewed school. Ethnicity, um, Asian is the plurality. Um, black is a, a little less than 2%, Caucasian 27, and so forth. So you get, you know, a background on it. And we're gonna follow the two 2013 cohort through, and we're just gonna look at their friendship patterns over time, and then some of the outcomes. Okay, so first of all, what we're gonna do is just look at how many friends they form. And um, these are you know, freshman year, uh, 2013, so these are close friends, so we ask them who their close friends are, and you know, freshman year they have some friends, sophomore year it goes up a bit, and then these are friends, the red are friends in total throughout the whole institute, um, blue are friends within their same class. So um, the, th this is just based friendships, but now let's look at homophily. So we'll start by looking at ethnic homophily. And ethnic homophily now is gonna be asking, pick two freshmen at random, and what's the probability that they're friends with each other? And you can do that for different ethnicities and same ethnicity. So if they're the same ethnicity, there's a much higher, more than twice as high chance that they're going to be friends um, if they're a different ethnicity than uh, same ethnicity. And that starts right from the beginning and it's pretty constant across time. So it's not changing much freshman, sophomore to junior year and they start right off the bat um, that they're more than twice as likely to be friends with somebody of the same ethnicity than across ethnicities. Okay, that's ethnicity. Gender um, has even higher homophily levels. And in particular, um, it actually increases from, from freshman to sophomore year. So it goes up a bit from freshman to sophomore year, um, but you see it also being fairly, fairly strong. And in particular, you're eight times more likely um, if you're the same in gender and ethnicity than if you're different on both. So people are interacting heavily with, within people, who, with others who are of the same ethnicity and same gender, and that ends up having some consequences. Um, there's a slightly larger gender than ethnicity homophily, and you see some increase in this from uh, freshman to sophomore year on gender, but ethnicity starts out um, strong. Okay, so that's, you know, we can think about homophily on all kinds of different dimensions. These ones are looking at, at ethnicity and gender. Now the next thing I wanna look at is risk aversion. So in particular, let's look at um, homophily on personality and behavior. I'm just gonna pick one thing out. We have a whole series of different measures, but I'll pick one that's fairly representative, um, which is risk aversion. You know, how, how likely are these people to gamble? So as part of the surveys that we did with people, we gave them some money where they could either have it as cash, just $10 cash, 
or we could spin a, spin a roulette wheel and they would get um, some payoff that was dependent on the roulette wheel. And then we could ask, you know, they could, they could risk, the, take the whole $10 or risk the $10 on the roulette wheel. And so we categorize people, think of people, some people just took the cash and other people spun the wheel. And roughly half and half. And so we can think of risk, you know, there's these risk, risky people who like to spin the wheel and there's other people that like to take the cash. And so now let's look at homophily on those. So how likely are you to be friends, if you're somebody who took the cash, are you, how likely are you to be friends with somebody else who did that rather than spinning the roulette wheel? Okay, freshman year, there's almost no difference. Whether you're different or the same on this, um, your friendship probabilities are nearly the same. By sophomore year, you start to see some difference. And junior year, you see almost twice as likely um, that you're gonna be friends with somebody who has the same kind of personality um, trait. And so one story here that we're trying to unpack a little bit more is that there are certain kinds of attributes which are quite obvious to people. Ethnicity, gender, these things are, are, are very evident and people cue off of those things. Somebody's personality traits and their, the way that they're gonna act and behave is something that you might also care about and look for similarity in, but it might take more time to evolve. And it's more time, it takes more time to realize what, what other people's um, traits are and, and to actually um, to begin to, to see the homophily in that. So it plays out and then we see the homophily um, you know, coming with a lag on that. Okay? So that's to say homophily exists on many different attributes and it can have different patterns depending on the attribute. Okay, so what are the consequences of, of the homophily? Let's take a look just at one particular um, outcome. Let's look at their GPA. So here what we did was we look at their GPA sophomore year and then we look at their GPA junior year, and we looked at their study partners um, at the beginning of the sophomore year and then see how that's gonna change um, their GPA from what they had at the beginning of sophomore year to the beginning of junior year, okay? So we're gonna look at their study partners, which is essentially has the same patterns as the friendships, and then look at uh, you know, how does having a friendship with somebody of the same gender matter? How does it have, uh, you know, same ethnicity? How does that affect your GPA change? Okay. And here's um, the, what we end up seeing. What's the gain in GPA that you have? Um, if you have somebody of a, a friendship or a study partner that's of different characteristic versus the same. So in ethnicity, there's a big gain in GPA from having a different ethnicity. Um, on gender, it's actually reversed. So on gender, um, it, it's having the same um, dominates different. And on risk aversion, it's actually um, same slightly higher. But this is to say that you know, homophily sometimes is, is helping, sometimes it's hurting. And in particular, it depends on the type of homophily you're looking at, and it also depends on the outcome that you're looking at. Now, one thing that's interesting about, so I'm just gonna unpack this gender homophily, and we're actually gonna look at whether it was both females, females to male, male to female, both male. There's a simple lesson here. Don't have a friend with, you know, males um, zero on your, your GPA gain. It all comes from having two females. So basically, no matter if it's male, 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 female, et cetera, um, it's zero when you've got a male involved. So um, I'm not sure what to make of that in terms of homophily, but it means that there's so many symmetries here in what these effects can be. And, and we, know, we need to understand these, these patterns a, a little better. So you know, in terms of these GPA changes, same gender gains, uh, but only when both are female, and then different ethnicity gains but it turns out that the different ethnicity gains come only when you're, when you're, both, um, when you're not both female. So the ethnicity gains are affecting the males more and the uh, gender um, is, is present only when both are female. So there's interesting patterns here in terms of how these social connections matter. And now we're, we're, we're doing a study at Stanford where we're gathering additional data on mental health outcomes and, and other kind, major choices and a bunch of other things where we can begin to try and see what are the mechanisms by which this is operating, you know, what exactly is happening in these friendships and why do we see differences depending on the composition of these friendships. Can we understand this a little more deeply? Okay. Um, I want to say a little bit now about some of the forces changing networks and some of their unintended consequences. And 
now we're going to look at um, a different situation where we can understand how networks are changing and how homophily can be influenced by some intervention. And in particular, what we're going to look at is um, a study of, uh, this is our Indian village data. This is a study we're just uh, um, finishing up now. Emily Braza, Abhijit Banerjee, Arun Chandra Sikhar, Esther Duflo, and Cynthia Kinnan. And um, this particular study, we did a, a study of microfinance spread in India. And we started in um, about 2005, 2006. And we were, went into a bunch of villages, 75 rural villages in Karnataka, and they were you know, isolated from microfinance. So microfinance are, are small loans that can be given to a family that are not collateralized. So you don't need any money to get one of these loans. Um, you don't need a credit history and so forth. Um, and then if you repay your small loan, you can get another loan. And um, they're given just to women. I'll tell you a little bit more about the structure of the loans. But this was a loan program. And we were trying to study how did information about these uh, loans get out through the networks in these villages. So we went into these 75 villages. We went in and we mapped out the social network structures in these villages to try and see how information spread in these villages and then how the eventual participation in this program varied as a function of the information structures. It turns out we got lucky. Um, this is uh, BSS was the bank. They it turned out they entered 43 of these villages and offered microfinance. But then they did not enter the other 32. And why didn't they enter the other 32? Because the financial crisis hit. So 2007, they were you know, starting to go into these villages. 2008, 2009, they had a credit crunch, and they stopped the loan program. And so they entered just over half the villages, but not the other half. And so what we can do is we can look and see how did the networks change as a result of getting the microfinance? Did that change the networks? Did it change the way that these villages operated compared to the ones that didn't get microfinance? And I'll say a little bit later uh, a little bit more about this, but um, you know, they didn't choose these. For us, it would have been perfect if they flipped coins to figure out which villages to go into and which ones not to. Um, they didn't flip coins. They did it by, by which employees they were training to go into there. But we did a follow-up study where we did a randomization. So we have another 104 villages that we went into where we randomized which villages to go to. And we'll get pretty much the same results, and I'll tell you a little bit about that later. So they entered some villages, not others. And we looked at the networks before and after, so we can see how the networks changed, and we can see what the impact of getting microfinance is. Okay. And so we're going to look across these villages and then see what the before and after is. So the loans were about uh, 10,000 rupees, so that was roughly $200 at the time of the study. So that's a, for one year period, so roughly 50 weeks. Um, interest rates, high credit card area, so it's between 30 and 40 percent interest rates. Um, that seems really high. It's actually low compared to money lenders, which tend to be in the 50 to 70 percent range. Um, so it's, you know, it's high, but not outrageous for the area. Um, these were given to women 18 to 57 years old, and you could get one of these loans per household. And Grameen style means that these, the way that they actually worked was you give these loans to a group of five women together. So you get five women together, and if any one of them defaults, all of them are called into default. So there's social pressure to pay back your loan so your friends don't get called into default too. And, and these loans, in our data, they have about a 99.5% repayment rate. So the repayment rates are very strong um, as a result of this kind of style of loan. Okay, so that's the basic structure. We're in Karnataka, which is, you know, we're in a ring around Bangalore, southern India. <coughs> Uh, this is a picture of one of the villages, relatively poor, you know, per capita income, a dollar or two a day. Um, you know, here's a picture of another village. So they're relatively poor villages. And then this is what a network looked like. So we went in, um, I'll sort of blow this up. These are households. So the group of these little dots, each one is, a, is an adult. And then the household is a group of adults that are all living in the same household. And this is this, um, uh, if this answer to a particular question, if you had to borrow 50 rupees for a day, who would you go to? So this is one network of just borrowing and lending small amounts of money. Basically one day's earnings, um, who would you go to? So you've got a, a network that results from that. And then you've got another network, who do you go to temple with? 
Um, who do you go to to ask for important advice? Um, who comes to you to borrow kerosene and rice? That's that kerosene and rice network. Um, who do you go to in an emergency for medical help and so forth? So we put all these networks together, and then we can see what the network patterns look like of how these people are interacting. And that was the one I showed you earlier for the caste group, is, is from one of these villages. And then we can look at this question that, that was asked by Ken Arrow some years ago. I think it wasn't, it's hard to think of a question that Ken Arrow didn't ask at one point in time. Um, so this leads to an important and long-standing question. Does the market, or for that matter, large efficient bureaucratic state, destroy social links that have positive implications for efficiency? So if we go in and put in loans in this village, is that going to rewire the networks? Is that going to change the structure of the networks? And in particular, will it change it for will we see differences across different subgroups in the, in the, in the network as well? OK, so what did we do? We, we looked at these villages. We have the 43 they entered, and then we resurveyed them afterwards. And the basic first thing you find is we can look at the, these are the 43 microfinance villages. These are the villages that didn't get the loans. And you can look before and after. And it's useful now to see the non-microfinance in comparison to the microfinance loans. Because what happens is we see a decrease in the uh, fraction of links. So this is just looking at how likely are you to have friendships with anybody. Okay, so just look at the overall network, see how connected people are to each other. How has that density gone down? So it went down by about 15% in the non-microfinance villages and about 30% in the microfinance villages. So by the control, this is like a control group, we can see that we saw roughly a double decrease in the overall connectedness in these villages in the villages that got the loans. And the basic intuition for this is now people have outside you know, sources of funding, they don't need to borrow and lend with each other's, with their friends anymore. They've got some of this money coming from this other source. And this also tends to affect other networks beyond the borrowing and lending network. It spills over into now, I don't, you know, borrow and lend with this person, I don't ask them for advice anymore. I, I don't see them, I don't go to the temple with them and so forth. So these networks tend to disappear and they're disappearing at twice as fast a rate in the microfinance villages compared to the non-microfinance villages. Okay, so that's one thing. It's rewiring some of the things, and that's an, you know, a possibly um, uh, important consequence of the program. And so we'd like to understand that if we're going to go in and give loans to people, we want to understand what's it doing to their informal social networks that should impact their lives as well. Okay, so the other thing we can ask is, let's get back to the inequality in homophily. Um, before, you know, we had a network. The after the network looks less connected, um, there's two sets of people in these villages. There's the, micro, the people who got loans, the microfinance participants. There's also the non-microfinance participants. There's people who didn't get loans. Are there differences, different impacts across these two different groups? And we could see the before and after, but it's hard to know. We want to be able to compare that across what would have happened, you know, not just um, with the microfinance, but what would have happened anyway. So there's, as we saw, we're losing 15% of the links regardless of what's happening. So why are we losing an additional 15%? Is it happening mostly among the greens or mostly among the blues? So you know, what, what would have happened without microfinance? Well, we also have these other non-microfinance villages, so we can use that as a comparison. The difficulty with the non-microfinance villages is we don't see who got loans and who didn't, right? So we have the, those as controls, but we can't divide them into the groups of loan getters and non-loan getters and see if those people are impacted differently um, as a result of this. Okay, so how do we do this? We try and estimate in these villages who would have gotten loans had they been available. So we can see the characteristics in, in these villages of who got loans and who didn't. So we can look and see, for instance, that people in certain caste groups are more likely to get loans. People that are higher educated are more likely to get loans. People who are slightly older are more likely to get loans. Um, people with more women in the household are more likely to get loans. So we can look at the demographics of the household and down here paint in the blues and greens and then use that to do the comparison and see what happened. Okay? So that's what's known as propensity scoring in the um, medical literature. So people do this all the time to try and figure out what, what happens from some kind of medical procedure or, or test. Um, and so here what we'll do is figure out from these characteristics who would have gotten these treatments. 
and we can do pretty well. So we, we put in people to higher low probabilities of getting loans, and then in the microfinance villages, we can go see you know, what per percentage of people that we predict would get loans actually get them, and what, per, you know, and so if we predict that you're high, in the microfinance villages, you have about a, a little more than 45% chance of getting a loan. And if we predict you're low, you have about a 4% chance. So we're doing reasonably well at sort of distinguishing. It's not perfect, but we've got some lens on who would be the likely people in these other villages. And then we can compare across the villages. So we'll call the highs the people that are likely to get loans, the lows the people that are unlikely to get loans, and now we can try and see what's the impact across these different groups. And the highs, we expect something to happen because they get loans, they don't need the friendships anymore. So the people we're worried about are the lows, who are the people who are not getting loans, are their networks also disappearing or some, are we seeing changes in their networks even though they were not um, getting loans? And so what we see is the highs, the post-link probabilities, non-microfinance, microfinance, we see a drop. The highs are losing links as we expected, but actually the lows are losing their connections across to the highs at an even higher rate and they're also losing connections to other lows. So it turns out the lows are even more impacted than the highs in terms of losing relationships. Um, and significantly so, if you, if you do the regressions on these things, the lows are losing um, links at a, at a higher rate. And moreover, this is happening not just in borrowing and lending, it happens in advice, it happens pretty much across the board, okay? And, and what's a story for this? A story for this, and, and you know, actually made a trip back there afterwards to try and talk to some of the villagers and get an impression of what was happening. So one story for this is, you know, people go and hang out in the town square, or they go out and hang out in a tea shop and get tea together. And that's one way they socialize and one way they maintain these relationships. And some of the people who get loans were, were more reticent to go there, both because now they didn't need to borrow from friends, and they were also afraid that people would be asking them to borrow money from them. So they stopped showing up in the town square or in the tea shops, and then the other people who normally went there stopped showing up as well because there's fewer people hanging out there and it's, it's less valuable. And so the, the sort of um, you know, community part of, that's being formed there um, is impacted by, this, uh, by, by the change from the highs. And so you see something impacting not just that group but also the, uh, the overall group. Okay? So we also did uh, a, a randomized control trial where we randomized over 104 villages half got microfinance, um, this was in Hyderabad. And you know, we do very similar effects in sign of magnitude. The nice thing about this is we could also measure what's the impact on consumption and sort of the economic outcomes for these people. And there, um, what we see is that the lows, the people who didn't get the loans effectively, saw an increased correlation between their consumption and income. So what does that mean? These people have very high vari variance in their income. So it's not like they're getting paid a set salary. Some of them are day laborers, some of them are just planting you know, different things, um, trying to make a living wherever they can, and they have high variance in, in income. And so what you'd like to see is even though they have high variance in income, if they can actually borrow and so forth, then they can smooth that. So it doesn't mean that some days they're, they're able to eat and other days they're starving. It means that they're able to eat a, a, a fairly um, uh, even amount across that. And what you see is that the lows see an increased correlation between their consumption and income. So they're, they're eating more on the days where they've got the income and then less on the days where they're not. And so that is having a, a, a welfare effect for the lows. The highs don't see this. So the highs are actually smooth. Um, we don't see any increase in their smoothing, but we, we, they're not being affected by this. And so the lows don't see a change in income, but they see a higher variance in income. Um, and so, you know, the microfinance areas, they're less able to uh, smooth income. Okay, what kinds of implications does this have? You know, it's saying that the exposure that these people have to these formal loans is changing the social fabric. So it's having consequences that were not part of the program. And that's not to say, you know, here we've got these lows losing relationships and, and so forth. It's not to say that we want to get rid of the program but it's just saying that the program has consequences that weren't intended, and that means that we should try and understand them and try and figure out ways that you can improve the outcomes 
for people given that we're changing the networks, not just changing the economic situations of the individuals involved. And in particular, we're changing it differently for different groups. So we're seeing unequal changes in the networks and unequal changes in the, um, the outcomes. Okay, so just in terms of themes, you know, these networks are shaping opportunities, information, norms. Um, homophily is an important driver of uh, outcomes and in particular things like inequality and so forth. So we understanding this homophily is important. Um, it depends, you know, the, the Caltech study shows us that the impacts of homophily can differ from one situation to another. Um, and networks are being non-trivially influenced by technological advances. And you know, when we think about policies, um, we can think about policies that overcome the effects. So getting information into people, um, giving, uh, changing the employment status of a given group, and so forth. Um, we can also try and change the, the, the network structures. So we can do things to try and enhance the connectivity so that people who are in disadvantaged situations ha actually have those connections. Um, I want to end with just a couple of pictures of uh, some, some trends that are going on over time and I think that, that are interesting to study. So there's a lot of things that are influencing our, our networks. And I'll show you one other change in homophily recently. So this is um, code I got from a computer scientist, Renzo Lucioni, and this is the US Senate. And uh, each one is a senator, each dot is a senator, and they're color coded by party. And there's a, a, dot, a link between two senators if they agreed with each other on votes more often than they disagreed. So if they agreed more often than they disagreed, we'll, we'll connect two of them. And um, if they're not connected, and again, this is drawn by a spring algorithm, so it sort of finds the parties and separates them out. And this is 1990, and 82% of the, of the senators were linked there. Okay, so what does that mean? It means you know, pick two senators, 82% of the time they agreed more often than they disagreed. Okay, fast forward, this is 2015, so this is before the 2016 election, and now you see a pretty clear cut, and I did not pull these things apart, the, the computer did that. Um, so the computer algorithm noticed that, that, that these parties are now split much more than they were before. So here, 53% um, are linked. So you see, you know, when you talk about is there increased polarization, yes, there is increased polarization, at least according to some measures of, of in this case, um, votes within the, the Senate. Um, you can, you know, color in your, your favorite um, Senator McConnell, um, Feinstein, Graham, Rubio and Cruz. Um, so, you know, there, there's, there's differences in these patterns, and I think technology is changing the way we're interacting, and it has the ability to be changing the the, both the connectedness and the homophily at the same time. And let me leave you with one other um, picture here. This is from a sociologist at Stanford, um, and a study that they've been doing for, you know, there's a survey that has been going over for many years of asking how people met their spouse. This is for heterosexual couples. It's actually even more pronounced for homosexual couples. Um, but here, what you're looking at is what are the different ways they met. And you notice online has gone up dramatically. Via friends, via family, via school is going down. So the ways in which people are meeting is changing. And in particular, when you look online, that's increasingly driven by some social, uh, social platform which looks at your characteristics helps you shop for other people with other similar characteristics, suggests friends to you, suggests spouses, dates, et cetera. Um, those things are done by matching your characteristics and looking at your existing network and, and um, you know, based off those things, which can actually, although it can enhance the number of people you can connect with, it can also increase the homophily at the same time. So you can be getting a world that's more connected and more segregated at the same time because of the way the technology um, interacts. And so I think, you know, there's a lot we need to understand about these dynamics, but it's just saying that homophily matters and it's being affected by a lot of changes that are going on in the world these days and we need to better understand both its consequences and its dynamics. So I think that's a, a good time for some questions and discussion and thank you very much. Don't be shy. It's always <laughs> takes a while for people to.
So I noticed most of the data you got for this um, for this presentation is connected to that India project that you did. I was wondering how do you start a project like that, going into these um, communities and trying to get them to trust you, and especially with um, just the wide variety of information and analyzing the things you didn't expect to get. Yeah. Um, so that that project was somewhat serendipitous. So I, I actually was in Abhijit Banerjee's office. We were talking one day and and. Uh, I'm very, I was interested in networks. He had connections in doing field work in India. And um, we just started talking about what would we have to do to be able to see how um, different patterns of networks affected information flows and affected outcomes. How many villages would we have to go into? Or how many you know, universes would we have to go into? And then it happened to be that Esther's sister was working in India. So it was all sort of serendipitous. but. In the end, what we did was, you know, if, you know there's sort of two ways to, uh, to get data these days. One is, you've got a question in mind, and you try to figure out what you need to get it. And the other is, data falls into your lap, and then you try and figure out what to do with it. And I think there's more and more opportunities these days where data sort of falling in our lap because of all the data that's being generated around the world and how easy it is to collect via computers these days. Um, but it's still important to approach the data with some questions in mind. And so that helped us design which questions we wanted to ask, how we wanted to ask them, how big the sample size. So the 75 villages were picked, that number was not out of a hat, it was what we thought we would need to get statistical significance to be able to determine the kinds of um, you know, hypotheses you wanted to test. And then we had to train teams. It was, I, you know, th this, that was my first real foreway into field data, so luckily Abhijit and Esther had been doing it for a long time. And, Arun um, is from Karnataka originally and so spoke the language. Um, so, you know, then we were able to sort of put teams together and go into the villages. But I think, you know, that you don't need to do things at that scale necessarily, but um, what you do need to be able to do is carefully plan out what's your plan for data to answer some particular scientific question. And, you know, um, this just involved a lot of data gathering. Nowadays, you can get data off the shelf, but I think it's important to have the questions in mind first. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, so for the GPA study you did at Cambridge University, I believe it was, right? Or, or Caltech, yeah. Okay, thank you, I was playing, I knew it was a C yeah. of some sort. Uh, did you ever consider the relationships between study partners of like how different their GPAs were? So you said you know gender and yeah. diversity and that sort of thing. But if you had like a 4.0 student, a 2.0 student, did you ever consider those relations? Yes, in fact. So what what tends to be true is the increase comes generally from the lower GPA student. Hmm. Um, you tend to to not see any drop for the higher GPA student, but you see a gain for the lower GPA student. So it's usually um, lower GPA moving up uh, in the cases where you have two females. Sure. Um, yeah. All right, thank you. And then just another question is, there's a lot of information and data here. Where do you see this being used, or how, how do you see this being developed long term to possibly help uh, change some of the, the differences that you brought up? Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is, is just getting a better understanding of how these things work. For instance, in the, with the Caltech data, that gives us better understanding of university dynamics, and you know, study what's the impact of, of certain friendship patterns and so forth. We're, in the study we're doing at Stanford now, we're collecting mental health outcomes and other kinds of things. We can see how that depends on people's um, groups and their dorms and so forth. Um, all of that, I think, then can help inform policies. So for instance, we have been in touch with the new residential policy makers, um, you know, trying to figure out what kinds of things can be done to, to improve the structuring of the, um, you know, the, the student body and so forth. And I think you know, a lot of this, you know, science is always incremental, so we do a lot of things, and each time we, we answer maybe a little bit of a question and then we come up with 10 more, and then we just keep marching forward, and eventually we get some canon of knowledge that we can begin to apply to things. And I think here we're just seeing more and more how social structure matters and specifically for economic outcomes and, and decision making, and then we can begin to put it together to try and you know, improve people's welfare and, and policies that understand the interactions between these things. Yeah. Cool. 
Thank you so much. Hi there. My question was mostly in regard to um, when you showed earlier about the num like the list of countries that showed uh, like the relationship between immobility and equality. Um, how would you say like nations that have like a great relationship with immobility and equality would go forth in uh, solving those issues, especially like near the end when you detailed like such bipolarity in uh, between parties like here in the United States? Yeah, I, um, so actually there's two, two things that are important to notice. Um, one is that if you look at um, the countries that are way down at the bottom, if, if you're looking at you know, Sweden, Norway, Finland, Denmark, et cetera, they're, they're fairly homogeneous countries. So um, some of the problems that they have in terms of, of um, ethnic divides and other kinds of things aren't as present in, in those societies. But they also also have uh, you know, um, education systems and so forth that are much more egalitarian than some of the other countries. I think a country that's actually important to understand is Canada, because Canada has um, you know is much further down on that you know down in the bottom left, which is the good part to be in compared to the United States. But it also has a fairly diverse population, both economically and um, ethnically, and yet it's you know it, it doing much better. Um, and, and I think part of that has to do with the education systems. Um, it does have to do with some of the government programs that are in place. Understanding the network structure is something that we're still looking at. And so, um, you know, we're, we're trying to begin to look at how the networks over different countries vary, but that's getting the right data for that is, is much trickier. Okay, thank you. Yep. Hello. I, uh... I forgot a pen and pad, so I uh, jotted a question down on my phone. Um, so in this presentation, you talked about um, affirmative action uh, and how that could reduce ethnic uh, homophily in the workforce. Um, my question was, um, what other solutions do you believe reduces ethnic homophily in the workforce other than affirmative action? Yeah, and, uh, um, it, you know, I think part of it is it, when, when you want to look at it in the work force, by the time we get to the workforce, there's also a lot of trends that have already happened. So people have segregated um, in terms of, so even look at a large company, and even if that company is diverse in terms of its ethnicity, it might be very diverse in terms of where those different ethnicities are in terms of the company and which kinds of jobs they're doing. And so getting things integrated within a company um, also depends on making sure that that, that integration happens earlier on and, and not waiting to that point in time. And so I think there, you know, there's the aspect of affirmative action can help um, propel things forward, but more generally, helping people get access to what they need to get educated at an early age. So there's you know, huge multiplier effects. I know, um, you know Jim Heckman's work on, on looking at early childhood education and sort of the multipliers forward on that, they're enormous, right? So you know, the, the more investment you make in a two-year-old or a three-year-old's cognitive skills, non-cognitive <coughs> skills, um, pay forward uh, hugely. And so there's a bunch of programs, um, you know, people like Raj Chetty and others have been involved in where they're looking at interventions that affect people in their childhoods. And those, I think, seem to be the most powerful points of intervention. So the younger you can do it, the more, uh, you know, forward um, progress you can get, and the more that their networks evolve, and, and the more I think you'll get long-term impact. So you know, affirmative action at university level or, or job level is sort of again, you know, it's it's closer to the roots, but it's not really getting all the way to the to the um, base of the problem yet. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering what type of inequality most concerns you at this point in time, and what would you like to see be done about it? Oh, uh, <laughs> um, that's a th I, I think, you know, for me, the immobility is, I, I, I'm much more worried about uh, immobility than, than Gini coefficients. So when I see high Gini coefficients, that's concerning, but the fact that people are born into a situation where you can predict what their life is going to be like, um, that I think is, is more of an issue. And I think, uh, you know, part of the difficulty in um, globalization has been that countries that are, are you know, we, things have been getting better across the board, 
but that hasn't been e evenly distributed within countries. And uh, making sure that that's more evenly distributed is important. Uh, you know, I mean, you've seen China make enormous new policy decisions within the last year on trying to address inequality. And, um, you know, they do it in a big way, very, uh, uh, in terms of the new education programs they have. But I think that immobility is the thing that would con concerns me most. Um, Again, we have time for So you were talking about you. A lot of your work focuses on describing these networks and understanding, you know, how they arise and how they change due to certain factors. Um, but have you? Ha has your work also focused on trying to um, enact, like, based on what you see affects this, hum like, these groupings and, and affects the network? Uh, have you considered, like, for example, with the loans that you talked about? Sorry. Not phrasing this very clearly, but if the you know five women are depend are codependent for this loan, if you force the network such that these five women come from the different subgroups within the the uh, like the the large group, would actions like that help reduce homophily? Um, yes, in fact. So uh, one thing we do know is that the the women who are put in together in groups of five, the bank actually does. So um, the groups of five, they don't allow people who are already friends close friends to come together and be put in the same groups because they don't want them to, um, to, to uh, you know, be, I guess, collusive or they're, they're worried about them being too close. So often they pick people um, somewhat randomly to put them together in these groups. And you do see friendships forming within those groups. And so putting people in close proximity in that way is a, is a very powerful way of, of forming interactions that wouldn't have occurred otherwise. And so we haven't done that explicitly as a, as a test, but from the data we can see that the women in those groups, um, among the highs, um, you know, there's a drop overall, but among the, the women who are actually in those microfinance groups, they form new relationships with their other, um, you know, uh, group members. And so that can be a powerful way. I think, you know, generally, one lesson I've learned is I, I, social engineering is gonna be a dangerous thing, but it's happening anyway in the world, so you know, um, any social media platform you're on is engineering your networks to some extent. You, know, you get new, new friend suggestions, new suggestions. So all these things have, you know, these loan programs, all these things have impacts on our networks. And it's happening um, somewhat organically out there in the world. Uh, we might want to better understand that I, I'm a little bit scared to intervene too directly in these things because you know we, we see side effects that we don't anticipate, but it, it does seem important to at least pe put people in, in situations where they have the opportunities to form those relationships and, and foster that more. Thank you. Thank you very much.